Hello, 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 everybody. I'd like to welcome y'all back to my own the shows of giants YouTube channel. If you don't know me, if, if this is your first time tuning in, I am Joseph Ward. And here at On the Shoulders of Giants, we tell the stories of the sung and unsung heroes of the African diaspora. Our stories from our perspective at your fingertips. And make sure you visit our website at www.ontheshoulders1.com to learn more information. For this YouTube channel, make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel. This video, make sure you like it, share it, and comment on it. Make sure as many people as possible have a chance to see this video because some great, great, great information is about to be shared tonight. And we have the return of the great scholar, Dr. Renoko Rashidi, back to our On the Souls of Giants channel. And of course, you know, I'm excited because we have a chance to sit down with a man who's traveled extensively through the world and who's dedicated himself to collecting information and stories of our history and sharing it with us. And we are blessed. We're definitely blessed to be in this presence and blessed to be able to have a chance to get this information. So Dr. Rashidi, welcome to my channel. How are you doing today? I'm good, brother. It's nice to be with you again. Yes, sir. I, I greatly appreciate you. And um, I'm, I'm ready. I'm excited. I'm ready to get into this information. Um, tonight, we're, we're talking about the African presence in the South Pacific. So I know this is an area that is not talked about a lot. Um, I've done a little bit of research, and I've, as I've did, uh, conducted my research, um, Dr. Rashidi's name was one that consistently came up as far as within the search of people who were, I guess you can say, considered authorities on the African presence in the South Pacific. So we're definitely blessed to be here today. So, Dr. Rashid, I'm not going to do too much talking because I'm excited and I'm ready to get into this information. So I'm turning it over to you, sir. Hey, brother, I'm very surprised to hear you say that my name came up among the list of authorities because I'm not an authority yes. on anything. And I'm definitely not an authority on the South Pacific. I've been there a few times. Mm -hmm. South Pacific is the same area that we, is commonly called Melanesia, which means the Black Islands. So I'll give you a visual overview of... Um, of the subject matter. I got a lot of photographs and I hope people will enjoy them. Let's see if we can pull up the photos. All right. Um, sorry, brother. I'm That's okay. still fairly new to this. Um, here we are. Uh -huh. All right. Can you see that? Yes. I apologize to the audience. This is <laughs> still a little bit new and they're, well, I don't have to go into it. I was going to say <laughs> different platforms, Zoom and WebEx and streaming. Yeah. And I always get a little, get them a little confused. So this tonight will be just kind of like uh, kicking it around the fire, showing photographs and talking about the history of African people. And when we're talking about Africans outside of Africa, black people outside of Africa, this is usually a nice little graph or map or whatever it is to start with. You can see Africa's the base is the root. And then you can see the branches, the fruit of the tree. This is very, very important. And I use it in virtually any presentation that I'm going to do, again, about the diaspora. That's a term that we use a lot. The word diaspora just basically means dispersal. And as I understand it, it essentially comes out of the Jewish experience. So it might be more accurate to talk about the global African community or the global African presence anyway. I want to start with that. And now <clears throat> this is another one I got off the internet. I don't know from who, from whom I got it, uh, but it's good. Black Oceanic, all of Melanesia. This is the area that we're looking at. Now I'm not going to do Australia tonight. Perhaps another time we'll do that. I have a lot of photographs if we have time and if you want to. I can show you a few pieces 
also from Micronesia and Polynesia, which also has an interesting history. But tonight we are going to focus specifically on the South Pacific, and this might be called an African-centered map. The countries that we're talking about, the countries and islands that we're talking about, first of all, are New Guinea. There are, I think, four countries in Africa called Guinea. There's Guinea-Bissau, formerly Portuguese Guinea. There's Equatorial Guinea, which I guess was colonized by the, um, um, the Spanish. And there's Guinea-Conakry. I guess there are three of them. Guinea-Conakry, which was colonized by the French. So it's interesting that these Europeans would call this massive island with these black folk New Guinea. And I think that tells you, that just uh, tells you the ethnicity of the people that we're going to look at. Now, New Guinea is the second largest island in the world, second only after Greenland. And it's divided into two parts. You have the eastern part, which is independent. And that is Papua New Guinea. One of the Papuans are one of the large ethnic groups there, black people. And the other half, the Western half is occupied by Indonesia. And our sisters and brothers there are treated brutally. Some say genocide is being committed right. against them. And we need to know more about that. And this part, the Indonesians call Irian Jaya and the black people there call it West Papua New Guinea. That's what I call it. And then you also have the Solomon Islands. Mm -hmm. You have um, New Caledonia, which is essentially a French colony. And then you have Vanuatu. And then you have Fiji. And I think that those are the islands. I hope I'm not leaving anything out. But at any rate, I believe we'll, that's it. we'll give a good overview as we go along. All right, let's start with Fiji. And why am I starting with Fiji? The only reason I could think of <laughs> is because Fiji was the first South Pacific island that I visited. Okay. okay. Um, Fiji is an independent nation. It's beautiful, man. People are friendly. My brother, when I think about paradise in my mind, I think of the South Pacific. Right. You fly into um, a city called uh, Nandi, that's where the big international airport is, but the capital is on the other side of this on the other side of this particular island. The island is called Viti Levu, and the um, capital is Suva. Okay. Uh, you have a smaller island. In fact, you have a series of islands. The big one is uh, Viti Levu, and then you have Vanua, Van, Vanua Leku and Lubasa. All right, let's go. Now, if you really want to give credit to somebody for being a pioneer in so many areas, including the South Pacific, I would say it would be Yosef Ben Yakinen. Okay. Ben, who has been an ancestor, I think, since 2010 now, 2011. No, not that long, but he's an ancestor, I think 2015, actually. Right. In the 1970s, <clears throat> I believe it was, it may have been the early 1980s before I really became interested so much in this area. Dr. Ben wrote a multi-volume book called Either We All Look Alike or They All Look Alike. Apparently, he spent some time in New Guinea. And so he's the first person that I know of to really deal with it. And then another brother from Bermuda wrote an article in what was that a little bitty magazine publication. I got it somewhere called The Black World. And his name is Roosevelt Brown. And he was from Bermuda in the North Atlantic. He also went there and did it. But my point is basically there are no real experts on this area that I know of from an African perspective. Let me put it another way. The history uh -huh. of Melanesia from an African perspective is yet to be written. Even the great Marcus Garvey himself didn't talk about Melanesia. Neither did Malcolm. All right. So here's Dr. Right. Ben. And then here's a sister. I love to acknowledge the sisters. This is Pauline Elizabeth Hopkins. And she was born in Portland, Maine in, eight, I believe, 1859. She died of complications from a fire. She was essentially burned to death in Brooklyn in 1930. And around 1905, she wrote a series of articles about these Black populations scattered around the world. And so, in a sense, she is also 
a kind of a pioneer. Her name is Pauline Elizabeth Hopkins. Uh, okay. Now this one, this is one of the few photographs I'm gonna show. Well, most of the pictures I'm gonna show are original pictures, meaning I took them myself. But here's one that obviously I did not take. This is an old black and white. I don't know when it was done, but these are the descendants of enslaved people. Okay. Enslavement also took place in the South Pacific yes. and it was called blackbirding. And these sisters and brothers were taken from their islands where they had lived on for uh, generations, if not thousands of years and taken to Australia right. to work in the sugarcane plantations there. And some of them are still there. When we think of the black folk in Australia, I think most of us think of the Aboriginal Australians, the first people of Australia, but there are different groups of black folk there, including these Pacific Islanders. Okay. Now these, these are Fijians. This brother was, a, I don't know, I'm kind of ambivalent about using the word chief, but he was introduced to me as a chief in a community, same, same ambivalence about using words like village and tribe. Gotcha. There's nothing wrong with those words, I guess, intrinsically. But I think that there is a kind of a coded language used to diminish African people. OK. Right. Anyway, this is a leader of a community in the highlands of Fiji. And here I am with him. Now, I told him and I'm sure he didn't know who the heck I was talking about. I said, you look like one of my teachers, a man named John Henry Clark. Yes. And I'm relatively certain he had didn't had never heard of John Henry Clark, but he played it off. Now, the reason we became very close is I'm in this community. This is my first visit to Fiji. This is about 20 years ago. And um, I, one of the interesting things about these sisters and brothers is that so many of them say, virtually all of them, that they come from Africa. And they say it with great pride. It's not like, you know, you have to force it on them. And that, I'm, I was turned on by that. So he asked me, where was I from? And I said, I'm from Africa. And he had, a, he just smiled from <laughs> ear to ear. And then he had the nerve to say, have you been to Africa? And I had the nerve to say that I go there all the time. And then he said, well, tell us about it. As a matter of fact, move here. <laughs> I'll find you a wife. I'll give you some land and tell us about Africa. And that was so refreshing. And it looked almost like a red, black, and green flag in the background. It does. <laughs> so these are from Fiji. Now, if you really want to bond with the people, and you can see I'm not being very formal, what you do is you drink kava. Kava is kind of like a communal drink, K-A-V-A. -A. And everybody that I interacted with <clears throat> drank it. It's the roots of a pepper tree. And the pepper tree gets to be about five years old. And then you uproot it and um, cut the roots off. And you grind them up until they kind of take on a kind of a powdery form. And you put them <clears throat> and, you, and you sell it. And everybody drinks it all day, every day, if you can. But certainly at night when you're just kind of kicking it around. And you don't go to anybody's house unless you have some kava with you. It's, it's considered very, very ill-mannered. And so I found myself buying lots of kava and hanging out with people and also drinking a lot of kava itself. It has a, it, it tastes like muddy water. Okay. And it's a big thing. It gives you a nice little buzz. Okay, so we're drinking kava. And these are some of the sisters that I met. And what stood out about these sisters was two things. The nice Afro, so many people wear Afro hairstyles there, the women in particular. But these sisters curse like a sailor. They use language that even had me blushing, brother. And that takes a lot. Now this sister, I fell in love with immediately. Why? She was a tour guide in a community that I visited. And it wasn't just any community. The community is called Visese. Mm -hmm. And they say is where these sisters and brothers say they landed when they first came from Africa. Some say they came from Tanganyika. Others would say they came from Egypt. <clears throat> but it's some part of Africa, and it's a big deal. And the say community is the place they say they landed. So naturally, I wanted to go there. But unfortunately for me, I found myself as the only black person in a large tour, uh, tour bus of white Americans. 
And, you know, there was like they all listened to the Tucker Carlson show, all right wing kind of folk. Right. And so I was not <clears throat> in good company. But the sister saved the day. We got to the community and she looked at all these folk and she looked at me, too. And she looked at these other people and says, you know, uh, we come from Africa and we speak an African language. And, you know, we used to eat a lot of white people, but the meat was so bad it made us sick. Brother, I was in love. I, I, I was <laughs> all of me, you know, bend the knee. But she was married. I said, sister, if you would just say that one more time. And she did, man. And those Europeans turned some kind of red. Now, she may have just been joking. Right, right. But I love the sentiment. Dr. Clark used to say we didn't eat enough white people. And if we <laughs> kept on eating, we wouldn't have the problems we have today. Right. Fiji. This is from a postcard. And these are just some of the folk I met. Okay. This is my Fijian queen. And this is just a family, incredibly friendly people. And I know <clears throat> that they were particularly friendly to me because I look like them and I identified with them. When I travel, I try never when I'm around other black people to give the impression that because I come from such a powerful country that somehow I look down on you. I see black folk and I, I say we are family and they feel that vibe most of the time and they treat me like that. And so the experiences that I have with travel is probably different than a lot of other folk. And this is these are just members of a community way up river. I had to really literally paddle a canoe to get there. Postcards okay. so, from the 19th century. <clears throat> and this is an Indian sister, I'll say, because just like uh, Suriname and Guyana and Trinidad, the British took people, I guess they would, would have been called endangered servants, from India and settled them in these various areas. And so the population in Fiji today is about half and half. It's about half East Indians and half um, native Fijians. And the friction is sometimes very, very strong there. Look at my brother. And this is also the first time, just a crew that I travel with, this is the first time that I actually saw natural blondes. Okay. Now, to my knowledge, black people are the first blondes, okay? Mm -hmm. And I'd seen it in books. You know, I'd seen, you know, I'd done researches as an anthropologist, but this was the first time I actually saw somebody with those physical attributes, and I was stunned. My tour group gathered around this child, offered him money, told him how cute he was, you know, asked to take his picture, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Gave him candy was the last thing. He needs. And finally, the bus driver said, look, we got to go. So we all jumped on the bus. And the reason they were so excited, this community about us, is because, again, we said we were from Africa. And they said we they were from Africa, too. So it was like a big homecoming. They had never right. seen African-Americans before. So we're in the bus. And the youngest of the tour members uh, came up to me and says, Dr. Rashidi, what kind of message do we just send those people? And the implication was, if you are lighter and blonder, you are somehow seen as more attractive, you get more attention, et cetera, et cetera. Because most of the folk in that community were much darker mm -hmm. and you know they were just regular folk. But when this child came out, everybody stopped what they were doing and gathered around this child. Now, one of the things about my tours is we generate a lot of good and serious conversation. We talk a lot. Okay. about serious issues. So we talked about that. And it really, really struck me. It seems to me that travel is the greatest form of education. And mostly, I think what you learn about is yourself. Mm -hmm. It's so you sometimes find yourself looking in a mirror and you see a reflection of yourself. And that reflection is not always attractive. Is that the case that we live in our minds, in the world that says, if you're white, you're right. If you're yellow, you're mellow. If you're red, go ahead. If you're brown, stick around. And if you're black, get back. Is this sense of colorism deeply instilled even in what today we will call the woke community? Is it almost like an instinct? Nobody even has to say anything. 
Yes. That's something to reflect on. We can talk about that maybe in our Q&A. We have a good From Fiji, this is just um, a flyer uh, of a lecture that I gave on my last trip to Hawaii. And there were a number of Fijians there, including this sister right here. So you can see the physical similarities mm -hmm. about six, seven years ago in Hilo, Hawaii. Now, hey, my, parents, my parents would fit in with their afros and their features. See, a lot of us would. Right. What we need is just communication, brother. Yes. We need to just talk to our family around the world. I think we would be surprised and pleasantly surprised at that. Now we are going to Papua New Guinea. So let's look at the map. Here's the island of New Guinea. The colonized part is on the west side and the independent countries on the east this is Papua New Guinea. Here are the flags, red, gold, and black from Papua New Guinea and red, white, and blue, interestingly enough, from West Papua. I've only been to Papua New Guinea once, but I tell you it was a, a trip of a lifetime, my brother. Something that I will never forget. <clears throat> I was I went by myself. I believe that this was 2010. I'd never been there before and didn't know anybody and didn't exactly know where I was going. One of the things that struck me, struck me almost immediately was a large, large scale unemployment. You could see a lot of brothers in the city center just kind of sitting around idle, nothing to do. Right. And this was the hotel staff. Now, these <clears throat> folk surprised and impressed me on another level. They literally picked me up at the airport. You know, I booked a hotel. And so they checked my flight arrangements and all of that. And a group of them in a van picked me up at the airport and drove me to the hotel. And again, it was obvious they had never met an African-American before, or if they had, they hadn't met any. And I was so happy to see them. So when we got to the hotel, and there were like four or five of these sisters and brothers, I gave them a $5 tip for everybody. Not a lot of money, <clears throat> but just for everybody. And there was, uh, I guess they weren't, they seemed astonished. And they asked me several times, is this for us? <laughs> what, I, what I found about these sisters and brothers is that it seems like they haven't been tarnished. They seem, in a sense, very pure and innocent, like you would want people to be. Right. And you can see the physical differences of some of these folk. Now, this is a pop one, a pure pop one, and I believe this sister is too. There are many different black communities there. Now we are going to a different part of Papua New Guinea. And this is a kind of, I guess it would be considered um, an autonomous republic, one of the many islands of Papua New Guinea itself. And this is East New Britain. And again, I went on my own, had never been there, none of that. This was my driver. And it's a long story, but we bonded because I had booked a hotel but there had just been a volcano in the area where the hotel was. And so I went to the hotel and the hotel literally was covered with ashes. Wow. And so my driver, Joe, helped find me a place. Oh, that's good. And here you have another group of blondes. Now I'm so fascinated by this as an anthropologist. I don't think it's because I believe they are particularly attractive or beautiful, just different. Right. And it shows the wide range of phenotypes of African people. So I was determined to take a lot of photographs. And I told Joe, this is what I'm going to do. And this is really, really a stupid idea. I look back and say, we're no, go. that was really, that was really dumb. I went to a store and I got a whole lot of dollar bills. I got like a hundred one dollar bills and I got a lot of penny candies. And I told Joe that for every adult <laughs> that we stop and I photograph, I'm going to give them a dollar, their equivalent of a dollar. And I'm going to give every child we photograph uh, a penny candy, just, you know, as compensation. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I was thinking about. Brother. Maybe, I, maybe I was drinking too much cob or something like that. But I got some good photographs and nobody turned the money down. They looked at me I kind of when I gave it to them. But nobody said, no, my brother, don't worry about it. I don't need that. 
and y'all kept it. And this is one of the best photos I got. Look at this sister right here. Now, sometimes the blonde hair gets darker as you get older, but other times it doesn't. And I love this photograph. Yes. Look at this elder. Yeah, for yeah. this this for me for two things. It I'm, go, I'm she, going back. What she she reminds me of one of the elders that were around growing up, like one of the friends of my mother's or one of the friends of my aunt's and my grandmother. That's what she reminds me of. But it also um it debunks the idea of like this blonde, like white people, white people are the only ones who are blonde and blindness comes from white. And this is what makes them attractive. It shows that we are the originators of all the phenotypes and all the different characteristics that humans can express. Everybody comes from us, brother, whether we like it or not. I don't know if that's a source of pride or not, mm -hmm. but we are the original and not only blonde, but what I guess some people call platinum blonde, the lightest right. shade of blonde. So I'll show you a few examples of that. School children and the blonde hair people don't seem to be distinctive. In other words, as I saw it, everybody is the same. You know, we're all black folk and the hair is really irrelevant. So just driving along the side of the road, giving out candies, being a fool. Now, this is Joe's family. Natalie wanted to take me to his home, which was an honor. And this is his son. Now, look at this child. This is another excellent, excellent photograph. Maybe the red shirt and the skin complexion and the hair. This is just a good photo. This is the one area where I'd really like to do more work and go back and more effectively document it. If not for the pandemic, I probably would have gone back to um, the South Pacific last year. This group, this community is from, a, um, or this is from the community of people called the Tolai, T-O-L-U-I. And I went to a school, gave a little mini talk. I guess I could actually say I lectured there if I stressed it and gave them a little presentation and they had a good time. This is a St. Augustine school okay. named after the African born saint in the South Pacific. And I asked them how many African Americans they knew of. And nobody could tell me very many. Nobody knew about Oprah Winfrey. This is before Barack Obama. Um, I think somebody might have said something about Magic Johnson. But you know, the African Americans that they were all familiar with, believe it or not, was Ben Carson. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> because he was considered a renowned surgeon. And I think somebody had right. given him a book, his autobiography, or a group okay. of African Americans that come or something like that. Okay. Now, this brother is a teacher in East New Britain. That's where we are. And he is from another community called the Buka. The word Buka literally means black skin. And you can see my complexion as compared to him. Mm hmm. The sister is told, I, man, I fell in love with this sister right here. She would not give me the time of day. <laughs> Look at how serious she's looking at me. I see. Oh, yeah, all the, you know, nothing was happening there. All of these sisters were are school teachers, and they were chewing kava. No, no, no. In Fiji, you drink kava. In these parts of the Pacific, you eat what is called bito. And I'll talk about that too. Okay. Looking mean again at poor Renoko. <laughs> <laughs> now, Joe took me to a place. I asked him about it. I says, Look, Joe, I looked in the guidebooks that I had, and I saw in Lonely Planet, for example, they said that you all historically have been headhunters and cannibals. And I said, Is that true? He says, Well, yeah. We used to be that way, but it's not like that anymore. He says, you don't have to worry. And he kind of looked at me and smiled. And he says, just to show you, I will take you to a place where my ancestors started eating some missionaries, but didn't finish. And they kind of buried them there. And he seemed to think that was incredibly funny. Okay. <laughs> I guess if you're not a missionary, you're cool. Yeah, it was funny. <laughs> yeah. Now, now, but here, check this out. These missionaries have done their jobs. 
because almost all of these sisters and brothers are Christians now. Okay. I'm talking about fundamentalists, Mormons, Seventh-day Adventists, you name the branch of, Christi of Christians and they are there. They've written, this is, I find to be the case all over the Pacific, but certainly here. All right, where are we gonna go now? We're gonna go just briefly to West Papua. West Papua I haven't visited because of the political situation. It's over here. But of course, I follow it. Now, the brother in the center in the red shirt is the great mm -hmm. leader of West Papua. His name is Benny Wenda. Yes. And he's the paramount chief of the Donnie people. I invited him to a big program in Senegal in 2010. And we really spent a lot of quality time together. There's Benny in the center. These sisters and brothers are struggling for their independence. Yes. I, le I learned about him. I wrote about him. I actually have a video about him on this channel. Um, oh. I found this story fascinating. Oh, well, we're going to have to talk about that, man. And I want to share it on my pages, too. Yes, sir. Anyway, the red, white, and blue colors. This is a photograph I took of Benny in Dakar, Senegal in 2010. That was his first trip to Africa. Okay. And here we are with Julius Garvey in the center, the son of Marcus Garvey. Yes. yes. And I oftentimes comment on the similarities between the phenotype of LeBron James and Benny Wenda. And I like LeBron, by the way. Mm -hmm. I admire his stance on social issues. Yes, sir. Where are we now? Now we are going to another part. You can see it's beautiful, man. Yes, it is. We're going to another part of the area. And this time we're going over here. If you can see my cursor, mm -hmm. we're going to a place called uh, Buka Island and Bougainville Island. And the population there, the people are the Buka, B U K which means black skin, and they have a reputation for being very, very dark. And I got some of the best photographs I've ever taken. I've got great photographs from museums. I've got great photographs from temples and tombs, but I also have some magnificent photographs, I think at least, of some of the communities that I, visit, that I visited over the world. And I'm about to show you some of my favorites right here. This is on Bougainville Island. Look at these sisters and brothers. And you can see the comparison. This is why I put it here. So here you have it. And this is from an anthropology museum in Vancouver, Canada. And these um, uh, wooden carvings are from the South Pacific. And you can see the, the blonde hair even there. And let me just show you some of these folks, some of these children, especially, I believe that this was at an orphanage that I visited. That's a nice one. I never even shown this photograph before. Wow. Look at this one. You're not going to see these in books, man. These are all original pictures. That's nice. Okay, so that so if you go back one, that's their natural this hair one color. or what or further? This, yes, sir. This one here, and see, this is their natural hair color. That's it. Now it's it's funny because we have our kids now they will dye their hair these particular colors to have that type of look in their head now. And that's, this is their natural hair color. That's it, my brother. Okay, that's cool. And this is a mean looking little boy. <laughs> Not only, now he doesn't have the brightish, bright colored hair, almost orange looking hair, but the hair is curly. And these are so-called unmixed people. Right. right. You see, it's very dark, and the pictures don't do the complexion justice. This little boy here mugging for the camera. <laughs> and this is one of my favorites right here. I would love to do a, maybe after the pandemic, a kind of a photo gallery, actually have a display of these pictures. I just think that so much more attention to this, this one needs to be brought to this part of the world. Exactly. <sighs> I might call this, and I believe it has been called, the eastern flank of the African world. And for most of the history of the world, we're finding out more and more, Black people weren't the only people. Okay. This is my driver, and a sister worked at the hotel where I stayed. She just went along to make sure that I was okay. Because to get to Bougainville Island, you have to cross on a dinghy. You saw those bodies of water. You literally cross on a little rubber boat with a, a, a motor. And hey, hey, brother, you know, and now, you know, my brother, 
I look back at things that I did 10, 20 years ago and say, we're no go. What were you thinking? Because now I just can't imagine doing a lot of the stuff that I did. <laughs> look at this one. Classic photograph. Yes. And this is the local brew. It's called SP, South Pacific. When I would travel to these places, I drink a lot of beer. I drink beer and I collect coffees okay, from all over the world. And I drink the beer and just hang out with the folk, just ordinary fella. Man, this is some of the nastiest beer that was ever brewed. It was really awful, but I drank a lot of it. Now here, you could, this is a pretty good collage I did. I don't, need, I don't even remember doing this. There's a wooden bus in the center and the two blondish haired children, but the hair diff is different here than the images that I showed you of that little boy in Fiji. Right. And even that sister, that elder in East New Britain. Now we are on Buka Island itself. And that's why I stayed. I went to Bougainville just for a day to see. It's quite possible that Bougainville will break off from Papua New Guinea and become independent. That's what they were talking about, the succession. All right. All right. But I love the people, man. I told them, um, don't treat me like you treat the Australian and New Zealander tourists. Most of the tourists who go there are white. And a lot of them go there uh, because you have a lot of sunken shipwrecks from World War II. And so there's a lot of diving there. I'm not inter interested in any of that. It's not, none of that. I'm saying it's me, 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 me. That's, that's not me. So I went to see the people. And I said, look, don't, don't uh, treat me like you treat these white folks. And they said, OK, we won't. And they more or less adopted me. I stayed at a little mom pop type hotel, black owned, I'm happy to say. And it was so hot and so humid. And there really wasn't much to do. So every day I would walk down the street just a few blocks before the heat would overcome me. And I would stop in front of a little post office. And I would just sit there all day and watch people watching me. It was obvious that I looked very out of place to them. And people seemed to think I was either a Jamaican or a South African. And I would just sit there and gradually we would bond. And it got to a point where one day I walked off on my own without telling the people in the hotel where I was going. They literally came looking for me. And these were the brothers at the airport. OK. These were the security personnel at the airport. And they shut the airport down to take a photograph with me. Now, they didn't know who I was. I could have been anybody. I'm not saying they recognized the great Renoko Rashidi. <laughs> I was just another brother. And they shut the airport down and really made those white tourists angry. They said, you have to wait. This is our country. And if That's you miss good. the flight, there's, there'll be another one tomorrow. Right. Now, if you see a picture of me like that at JFK, get a GoFundMe page because I'm yeah. going to take me to jail. It's a bit different. <laughs> a huge difference, man. Yeah. Psychologically. Yeah. You know, when I travel to these places, it's like stress is just taken away from me. The moment I get back to the United States, I feel stressed all again. And I could get shot at any time. I could be racially profiled. I could be at the wrong place at the wrong time to be the victim of a random act of, random act of violence. And I think... It's not until as a black man you leave the United States that you are able to feel the difference. I think that just being in this stressful environment takes years off our lives. And we can relate to that now, I think in particular because of the news of all of these sisters and brothers being shot down. I agree. Now you can see the red lips. That's from chewing um, beetle. Beetle is a it's like a, <clears throat> the size of an acorn or a walnut, a, not a walnut, but an almond or something like that. And it grows on a tree <clears throat> and you take it and you get a banana leaf and you put it up, put the a beetle nut, beetle nuts <clears throat> in the leaf, one of them, and you sprinkle lime or salt on it and roll it up till it's real tight. So it's like a, a cartridge or something, a bullet. And you okay. put it in your mouth and you chew it. And it really is it's a strong, you, give, you, you have a strong rush and almost everybody uh, chews it. It's a big deal. And you can see over a period of time, it turns your mouth bright red. Mm -hmm. 
and it makes you salivate. So people are spitting a lot of the time. Hey, I tried it once, brother, and that was enough for me. So is it is it like similar to like chewing tobacco or? No, it's much, much stronger than that. Oh, but wow. I guess I guess it would be similar in a sense. But I found it to be much stronger. I could only keep it in my gum for like a, a few seconds or so, and I would spit it out, and then they said, well, try another one. Okay. Right. This brother took a liking to me. <clears throat> and one day, I was sitting in front of the post office, and he says, come with me, just like he was ordering me. And I said, OK. And he had a pickup truck, and he said, get in. And he just drove me around the island and he talked about the history of uh, Oak Island. This is their flag. You can see the post office boxes in the background. I love these people. Got to the same shirt on. Yeah, man. Okay. He's not so popular probably anymore. You're right. And somebody, and now look at this now. This is interesting. Let's go back here. Look at the markings on that sister's face. Mm-hmm. I think that you see something like that among the Yoruba community in Nigeria. So okay. again, I don't know anybody that's done any serious work from an African perspective on this area. It's like it's just begging for research. Look at this, brother. Yeah. Look at all it's these photos, <laughs> man. I asked her uh, if I could take her picture. And by this time, people were kind of getting to know me. And we were talking about the presidential election. And she says, are you going to vote for Obama or the other guy? I said, my sister, I'm going to vote for Obama. She says, wait a minute, let me fix my hair. Look. Yeah. And somebody, yeah, I love Jesus. Somebody, I told you the missionaries got him, man. Yeah, they did. And somebody, I forget which, I think on the day I left, told me that we can take you to uh, areas on the island where there are people 10 times blacker than us. Can you imagine? Wow. Now, that's enough to make a brother yeah. want to go back right there. The, 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 past pic, the past picture, the guy on the left with the the, the flower shirt, with the shirt and the glasses. I have a friend named Mr. Leroy Jackson. If you put Mr. Leroy right next to this guy, <laughs> they are brothers. I swear he looks just like Mr. Leroy right now. <laughs> and they treat you like brothers. They give that's you their, good. they share their food with you. Oh, man. <laughs> When I left the airport, when I left, some of them, some of the people at the hotel literally cried. And they weren't crying, I'm sure, but we're glad we got rid of that brother. They it was like a family member was leaving them. All right. I could just show these till the cows come home. Where, where are we going now? Oh, now we're in New Caledonia. Mm -hmm. New Caledonia is the French colony. They call it an overseas territory or something like that, but it's a colony. And the black folk are a minority there. This is one of the great resistance leaders. His name is Alte. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the French still have his head. I recall reading an article that cut his head off, making an example of him. And it seems to me, I recall reading an article not long ago about efforts to either get his head back, because it was in a museum, or they wanted to get it back. These are just some of the totems I photographed in New Zealand. I'm sorry, New Caledonia. You also have there a number of people from Polynesia, like from Samoa and I gather Tonga. And this sister looks like she's more Polynesian than Melanesian. Big people too. They worked at a restaurant that I went to. I also would like to have the local food. And this is, obviously this is not my photograph. Mm -hmm. um, my daughter's mom sent me this picture and it's really, really, really nice. This is a Kanak woman. That's what the indigenous people there are called, Kanak, K-A-N-A-K. -K. Okay. In Vanuatu. I think I'm going to start to wind down with Vanuatu. Vanuatu is, the, Vanuatu is the most recent South Pacific island I visited. I believe that this was in 2014. And Vanuatu will always stand out because I got caught in a cyclone there wow. and it had to be evacuated out. I had a ticket in my pocket to go to the Solomon Islands. That would have been the last <clears throat> place in the South Pacific I hadn't visited. But the cyclone hit the first day I was in Vanuatu. I stayed, I think, two more days. 
and I had to be evacuated out to New Zealand. I was, I guess, lucky to get out of there. Although they're a worse place to be stranded. So these are the people of Vanuatu, the hotel I stayed in. And this, look at this one. <clears throat> this is an elder that I met in the marketplace. Now, all day from the time I got there, I flew in from New Caledonia. From the time I got there, I've been hearing there's going to be a cyclone and be prepared. Well, I'd never been in a cyclone before. It didn't register with me. I thought a cyclone was like just a lot of wind, literally. And people kept saying, well, we got to get ready. Got to rest. Oh, well, OK, cool. Get ready. And I went to the market in the afternoon and all at once people started taking their stalls down because they were saying they had to get ready for the cyclone. I said, wow. Okay. So I get back to my hotel thinking the worst that would happen is I would lose my internet connection. That's how naive I was. My brother that night, the fourth largest storm at that time to ever hit land, hit the exact area. I was, I was in the epicenter of it. Wow. 175 mile per hour winds. It was an experience I hope nobody ever goes through. Right. And <clears throat> these were the people that I saw and the people who came after the cyclone and helped me, who got me out of my hotel room, who got, you know, who shared their water. All the electricity was down. They gave me part of their food and they looked after me like a brother and they treated me fundamentally different than they treated the uh, Australian and New Zealand tourists, they really treated me like a brother. So we talk about Pan-Africanism, but that was an, an occasion where I actually experienced it in practice. So it wasn't just a theory, something that you find on the internet. It wasn't just talking about Marcus Garvey. They treated me like family. Right. And I know it was, was uh, because of race. All right. So that's where I stayed. And you can see a lot of these sisters and mothers lost everything. Yeah. And I don't know if Vanuatu has recovered even to this day. And what year did you say that happened? This is 2014. Okay. Now, let me show you some photographs from Vanuatu that I didn't take. Okay. Okay. And I think I'll show you some from uh, New Ireland also, and we'll call it a day. These are just beautiful people. Just photo gallery. Look. This is from Vanuatu I know because of the red, black, and green, and gold flag. And these are pictures that people have sent me over the years. And some of them, I think, are just spectacular. And a lot of them do look like folk that we know. Yes. <laughs> yeah, we could go back and look at this collage. Here's Dizzy Gillespie. Here's Bill Cosby. Here's, we'll just say for the fun of it, Bob Marley. And I think this sister is just gorgeous right here. Uh -huh. When I think about leaving the United States, really there are two areas, you didn't ask me this, but I've been asked in interviews before. Okay. There are two areas that I think about, and it's not and Africa is not one of them, believe it or not. One is Europe, because my daughter lives in Paris. And okay. you know, in Europe, you from Europe you can go to virtually any part of the world relatively quickly. They got all those museums there and you have just enough black folk to make you feel comfortable. But the other place I think about is Melanesia. To me, it's the closest thing that I've experienced to paradise and all the places that I've traveled. And that's a lot. And it's a vast area. Right. And relatively unexplored from an African perspective and Pan-Africanism. So perhaps, who knows, somebody listening or watching this presentation will be inspired to take up the torch and, and do the research, to go and talk to these sisters and brothers and get their story from their perspective and not just what the anthropologist said. There's a lot of books written about these areas from an anthropological perspective, but not any real histories that I'm aware of. And again, no African, look at this photograph right here. Yeah. And this is Vanuatu. Uh, and many of them look like folk you would just see. Exactly. Where? Mm -hmm. It's beautiful people. It is. And it's almost like a whole nother world. 
Exactly. And my brother, I want to thank you. It's not often that I get a chance to share these photographs. And I, I appreciate you. This is one of the areas I learned about um, when I first got to college, maybe around 2002, 2003, first learned about the South Pacific when I learned about the inhabitants of the Solomon Islands. And that that was the beginning of my interest in, OK, well, what's what's happening on the other side of the world? Because I will watch I watch the Discovery Channel a lot uh, when I was young and in the History Channel. But I always enjoyed when they went to the South Pacific and they <laughs> and they showed the people. And I'm like, hold up, these are black people. That dude yeah. looks like my uncle. He looks like my uncle. And so my my question then was, well, how many more African people are populated throughout the world? Yeah. And so that's why I appreciate you because I I found your information and you were telling more of the stories about African people around the world and these. I, I feel like you just showed me pictures of my family and we're about to go to the family reunion. Okay. Yes. Now yes, we sir. are in New Ireland, I believe now. We've gone from Vanuatu. And remember okay. these, on a the map, the area doesn't look that big. Okay. But in reality, we're talking about thousands and thousands of miles of water. Right. And maybe it's a mistake to lump these sisters and brothers all together. But it seems to me that we have a whole nother African world here or a whole nother part of the African world. So I believe we're in New Ireland now. Yeah, in fact, New Ireland is a part of Papua New Guinea. And if I had had, I was only able to visit two places. First, obviously, if you're going to Papua New Guinea, you're going to fly into Port Moresby. That's the capital. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if it was because of money or time that the ticket that I purchased had an allotted amount of time. But you could or maybe I just made the decision for practical purposes since it was my first trip there. And I was in my mind convinced that I would soon be going back, that I would only go to two major places. So I went to East New Britain and I've shown you that. And I went to Buka Island and I, I was able from Buka Island to go to Bougainville Island. But if I had a third choice, it would have been New Ireland. Okay. And when I go back, this is going to be one of the places I, I visit. And listen to the names, East New Britain. New Ireland, the Solomon Islands, these are all named after Europeans. I don't yes. even know the indigenous name for these places. Warm, friendly people. Yep. This is also from the Solomon Islands. So you can see there is, there's even physical diversity in these various islands. Look at this one. Bright blonde. Right. Solomon's. Now, those are the photographs that I wanted to show. If people are really interested in hearing my stories and seeing some of the pictures and what have you, here's my travel book. This is like a semi autobiographical travel book, my global journeys in search of the African presence. If you go to my website, drrenoco.com, or email me at renoco at hotmail.com, you can. Um, you know, you can get information about how to order the books, about my tours, etc. And this is my upcoming webinar. This is Friday, April the 30th. And Saturday, May 1st, I'll be looking at the African presence in early Europe, the Greco-Roman world, the Black Madonnas and the Moors. Now, brother, I have a few more on uh, Micronesia and Polynesia, or we could... And we could stop here and I can show those another time. What do you want to do? We did good uh, uh, one. Uh, you can show them. We have time. You can show them. They're not that many. So we'll, okay. we'll show a few, a few more. Okay. Now this is now we're in Micronesia. So you have three major island chains. Mm -hmm. You have Melanesia, which means the Black Islands. And then you have Micronesia, which means the small islands, the little islands. And they include places like, and it's really scattered too. Yes. It includes Guam, I believe Saipan, you have Palau, you have Truk, you have the Marshall Islands, all that is a part of Micronesia. This brother is from a place called Kazre. I had never heard of it before, but on this particular trip, and brother, I don't remember where I was going ultimately, but on this particular trip, I think I was going to Palau. Mm -hmm. But this was on Continental Airlines at the time. And Continental had a, 
kind of like a monopoly. And <clears throat> if you were flying and you got a certain kind of ticket, you could stop literally at any of the islands on the way. So on this trip, I stopped at about four Micronesian islands. And this was the first one I stopped at, at a place called Kosrae, K-O-S-R-A-E. I never heard of it before. I went in a museum and this is a photograph that I found. Now to me, he looks like Morgan Freeman. Yes. That's what he reminds me of. Okay. And this was my driver. Again, this brother had a, I think his mother was from Palau. And his father was an African American, or one of, the, or the reverse of that. <clears throat> and he has spent a lot of time in New York. Okay, he's a taxi driver, and he had just recently moved back to uh, uh, Palau. I said, and the, Palau is an independent island nation, by the way. I said, brother, why would you know if you left New York to come here? As if you know that's a huge difference. This bustling city to this tiny little country. And I said, why? He says, because we all know each other here. We care about each other here. Yeah. Like, we haven't heard about a rape in 10 years. You don't hear about homicides here. So <clears throat> this brother, he was the kind of driver. I mean, he drove me around one day and then he dropped me back off of my hotel. And I said, how much is it? And he said, $40. I said, wow, $40 is a lot of money. He said, how about 20? And just kind of shrugged his shoulders. I'll give you another example about how I was treated there. And I'll never forget this. I got to my hotel at night. I think it was run by um, Filipinos. They do a lot of the retail stuff there. Filipinos are a lot of the workers and they own a lot of the businesses and the Japanese, the major tourists, at least when I was there. So I, I needed to go the next morning to an internet cafe, a cyber cafe, and that was one a few blocks away. So I went down there and I get there and I check my email and all that. The connection wasn't all that good, but it was better than nothing. So I'm walking out into the bright sunshine. It's about 10 a.m. And right on the other side of the street from the internet cafe is a police car. And there's a cop in there and he's looking right at me. He's black. <laughs> But he was a policeman. And I said, I hope I, you know, kind of made right. me nervous. You know how that right. works. Exactly. And so I'm walking out minding my business. He said, hey. I said, uh, damn. I said, hey, brother. I don't know. I don't think I had the nerve to say brother. I think I might have just said, hey. He says, what are you doing here? And I said, I'm, I'm on vacation. He says, what, who do you know here? And as it turned out, I had formerly when I taught at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, I had a student from this area. Okay. You know, that made me want to go. He was a brother. So I said, and he said, uh, come here. I said, this guy's going to hassle me. Here I am minding my own business. And this brother's going to give me a hard time. <clears throat> and I get to the car and he says, get in. And I said, no, you know what I mean? <laughs> right. And as I get in the car, he reaches out and he grabs my hand. He says, my name is John. What's your name? He said, where are you going? I said, my honey said, it's too hot, brother. Let me drive you. And he drove me around and said, you know, we can hook up later if you want to. We'll have a few beers. I introduced you to some ladies. The whole trip was like that. Oh, that's amazing. Amazing, my brother. And I know it was because I was a black man. And wherever I went, the people treated me in an exceptional manner. And it was clear that that is what it was about. Now, to me, that's really true Pan-Africanism. That's yes. just a theory. But how we treat each other. All right, let's wrap yeah. it up. Pretty place, as you can see. It's below. Mm -hmm. Look at the water, so blue. Some art from a place called Yap. There's my flyer I talked about when I was at the University of Hawaii. Now you can see we're in the Western fringes now. Right. That looks so Africoid, but it's not hard to see with those noses and lips a black person there. Uh -huh. These sisters are from the Marshall Islands. They were very friendly. I walked up to them because they seemed kind of standoffish. And they said, we are family. We are the same. And they act like they really meant it. That's crazy. These are all from Micronesia. And this is New Zealand where they filmed uh, Lord of the Rings. Okay. And these are some of the Maori I was able to get pictures of. The Whanganui Maori. Look at this. And look at this sister. Now, I posted this on Facebook. This is uh, from a book that I bought in a museum. 
And I posted this on Facebook and naturally somebody took it and ran with it because I wasn't watermarking stuff at that time. Mm -hmm. And this is circulating on Facebook now and there are people who are claiming this is a Native American. This okay. is a black woman from New Zealand from a 19th century photo book in New Zealand. Now that's a sister right there. Right. And finally, Hawaii itself, the 50th state, if I'm not mistaken, and Hawaii, like the rest of the Pacific, at one time had a clearly indigenous black population. And you can see memories of that in these statues of Kamehameha the Great. In the 19th century, this is the man who attempted to unify the Hawaiian Islands. And I understand there are three sets of these statues. Maybe I'm wrong, but I found at least two. This was the first one in Honolulu. Uh, I'm going backwards. And this is the one, the most recent one I photographed in Hilo. And I was able to get a lot of pictures of this one. Yes, I have, I have also have a, a, a video in the profile of Kamea Mail on this channel as well. Oh, really? Well, I got to check that out. I want to go back to Hawaii and take some more pictures. But right now, if you go, you have to be quarantined. Right. All right. And there's, this is what I want to go and get an original picture of. I see there in the Bishop Museum, I think, or the Iolani Palace. This is a postcard. But I would like, you know, me and my original photographs, I would love to go back. But that's a black man. There used to be a song that used to be sang about these sisters and brothers, an American racist, a redneck, I think, is supposed to have said something like, you might call them Hawaiians, but they look like niggers to me. Okay. And this is from a cover of a book I bought in the airport in Honolulu called And Then There Were None. So a lot of the sisters and brothers who died in the Pacific didn't die uh, as a result of warfare. They died from disease. Disease is brought to, um, brought to the area by Europeans. I guess smallpox, measles, et cetera. And in this particular book, you see the census. And so like in 1840, you had this many Native Hawaiians. In 1845 and 1850, and they, the numbers would get smaller virtually every year. Right. So most of the people in Hawaii now, as you know, are actually from Asia. They're Chinese, they're Japanese, they're Filipinos, mixtures of all of that, and very few of the original Hawaiians. From Easter Island, I don't know what to say about that. And that seems like a good time to stop. We've given, I think, a pretty good overview, but I think that at the end of the day, at the end of this day, we are still left with more questions than answers. Yes. But we have an uh, exciting history and uh, there's so much uh so much information to uncover so right. that's it bro right. right um one 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 person has a question um they want to know as far as when you were saying you would move outside the united states they want to know yeah. why either europe or melanesia why not africa because my family is in europe it's harder to get it's easy to get from africa from europe to africa and most of the trips that we take to uh, the motherland, you stop in Europe anyway. And mostly because my daughter is there. I try to be a, a good historian, but I'm also a good father. She's born there, she has Senegalese roots. And Melanesia, simply because it's so new for many of us. And to me, it's like Africa in the Pacific. I love Africa, I've been to 34 countries in Africa. I don't think I have to prove my love for Africa. But when I think about moving out of the United States, those are the two areas that I think about the most. Right. So like and I do have a question about Benny Wender because he he's somebody that actually he really fascinated me when I when I learned about his story. Um meeting him, what was that experience like because especially you're talking about they're in the middle of fighting for their independence. Mm -hmm. So what was that experience about meeting him knowing that he's one of the leaders who's helping his his people in the fight uh, uh, for independence and getting the word out? Um in 2010, the government of Senegal decided to have a, a month-long cultural arts festival. And they decided that the first week would actually be a series of conferences. And they had seven of them. One was on the diaspora, 
One was on Africans in science and technology. One was on health, three or four others. And <clears throat> something interesting happened. I was asked to be the president of the diaspora portion of it. I have a, a series of books published in French. Uh -huh. One of them is on the African, in fact, a couple of them on the African presence in Asia. So a sister in the government of Senegal, or whose husband was in the government of Senegal, happened to be in Paris and they went to the black bookstore Présence Africaine. And they had maybe 10 of my books for sale and they bought all of them and brought them back to Dakar and it created a big deal. In fact, well, I'll get to that story in a minute. So I was known in Senegal as this African scholar. And so they invited me to be the president of the diaspora portion of the conference. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, <clears throat> I can invite anybody that I wanted to. I invited a sister from Australia. I invited a sister from Turkey. I invited a brother or somebody else invited a brother from Algeria, which is another part of Africa. I invited a brother from India. And I invited, I had to look for somebody from the Pacific. And I looked and looked, and I don't know how Benny Wenders' name came up, but I invited him, they paid for his ticket, and sure enough, he came. And it was a life-changing experience for him. He had never been in Africa, wow. had only read about it, and there he was embraced as a brother. So Benny and I really, really, really hit it off. Now he, at the time, was living in Oxford, England. As I understand it, the rest of his family had been killed. And so it wasn't difficult for him to come from the UK in Europe to get to Africa. And we bonded, but we've since gone in different directions. I love Benny, and I would love to connect with him again, but we just haven't been able to connect the last few years. He told me, uh, we met, um, did another program together in London, and he told me that when West Papa became uh, independent, he was going to make me uh, the ambassador to West Papua New Guinea that I didn't have anything to worry about. His children called me uncle, and he right. called me uncle. So I, anything, anytime anybody mentions West Papua, anybody mentions Benny Wenda, I think it's a good thing because African-Americans are in a position to publicize these kinds of issues, and we can have an impact, just like we impacted apartheid in South Africa. We just need to know about it. So I think what you're doing, my brother, is a very good thing. I appreciate it. He's a he's a great man and and I'm I'm down for what he's fighting for because we have similar fights here. We fight yeah. all are fighting for our, our true independence. Yes, sir. Um so Conan Lee is asking, can you speak on the Papuans as the original and oldest inhabitants of the Pacific, like Micronesia, Polynesia, and Melanesia? Well, I assume that they are. Okay. But again, I haven't really read that from a I cannot say that with certainty. Obviously, okay. they're very ancient people and they're a large population group. Whether they're the first to inhabit the Pacific, I don't know. But that's a very, very strong possibility, I would say. Okay. Uh, and and uh, do you know around the like the time frame? Because some of the information I came across was saying about 70 years ago, the migration out of Africa came down to the South Pacific. Uh, do you have any information to kind of uh, see if that's true or not. 70 years ago, is that what you about, meant I mean, excuse me, not 70, 70,000 years ago, excuse me, that's what I meant to say, about 70,000 years ago, a migration out of Africa into the South Pacific. Benny Wenda gave me a paper, and my brother, I've been looking for it ever since, that's in a, a thick paper. And he said that they have been in West Papua for either 30 or 35,000 years. Now, the reports that I get about Fiji says that those migrations are three to 5,000 years old. Here's what I think, and I think that this is very similar to most of the world, including uh, the Americas. I think that there were probably, or there quite possibly, were multiple migrations okay. at different times. If you go to Australia, it would seem like the earliest movements there are like 60,000 years. And then the Pacific Islands are right next to it. So you would think that migrations to the Pacific must have been around the same time or perhaps earlier or a little bit later. But I would think that there was, in fact, for Australia, I know, and I think we can say pretty much the same about the Pacific. It wasn't one migration. It was numerous ones. Let me tie that into the United States. I mean, to uh, the Americas. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. You have black folk, the children of Africa, who are clearly the first people in the Americas. Right now, there seems to be a scientific debate as to whether they come from Australia or from the motherland. Right. I think a very small group of black folk that today we will call pygmies ended up in the Americas maybe 70, 80,000 years ago. And they were followed by another group of black folk who look a lot more like the indigenous Australians. And then I think you have Pacific Islanders coming over, like we talked about today. And then I'm sure that you have black folks sailing on boats directly from Africa here. These are the first people of the Americas. And then you have African people like those that the Olmec heads represent, okay? Now, a lot of folks get mad at me when I talk about the African roots of the Olmec. It's your time to get mad, okay? Because I, I do slash and burn when it comes to that. There's no doubt in my mind that those 20 heads from the Olmec civilization, those are the heads of African people. But I don't see any evidence that those are the descendants of those first Africans. I think that those are black folk who came later. And then you have the voyages that we hear about from Mali, the predecessor of Mansa Musa, Bubakar II, apparently came over here with a fleet of ships. And I have no doubt that there were other migrations. And then you have Africans who were uprooted and captured and take. So there are a number of migrations to the Americas, voluntary and involuntary. I think you have a number of migrations to the Pacific, and they're not just one. Gotcha. Gotcha. A lot more uh, research has to be done, bro. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, I got to be the one, one of the ones doing it because I want to be a part of the the generation, part of people that carry this history and this information on to the next generation. Now, don't be telling me that if you're not going to do it, man, because I'm going to push you on that, brother. I, I want you to push me. I'm here to do it. Yes, sir. I'm signing up. Whatever you right, need. Everybody, me. everybody is listening to this now. Yes, sir. This is April 23rd, 2021. Okay. Yes, sir. Some people say in the year of our Lord, but I won't go that far. <laughs> no, it's yes, important, sir. brother. We have work yes. to do. Yes. And we are the ones best qualified to do it. Who but us can tell the story of our people? Exactly. And if we don't do it, whose fault is that? Uh, It's our fault because it's on us to educate us about us. But at some point in time, you're going to have to you're going to have to go over there. Yeah. Yes. You're going to have to see it. You need to uh, reconnect if you haven't already with Benny. We need to make a more concerted effort to publicize the struggle that's going on over there. Mm -hmm. And any sources that I get, I'll send your way. I and hopefully it. other people want to rally around that too. Yes, sir. I, I definitely appreciate it. I appreciate your time, your information, just everything. This has been a pleasure. You're the coolest, Doc. I appreciate you. I love <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, one thing I have going for myself, and this is very, very important. I love what I do. Yes, yes. it's work. And sometimes it's frustrating. And you rarely feel like you're getting the support that you deserve. But what keeps me going more than anything else, more than just love for black people, which I have, I love what I do. I love this research, brother. I love the intellectual stimulation. And I love being a part of a movement to reconstruct the history of our people from our perspective, without stuttering, without whispering, without stammering, and mostly without apologizing. So uh, it's been a good day. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. All of the questions, all the comments. It's been great. And once again, the great Dr. Renoko Rashidi. Definitely look forward to having you back. Look, you can come on this channel anytime you want to get to give information. So let's just make sure we keep well, this thing going. Let's do something on the old mech. Okay. Because you got a lot of trolls out there, a lot of right wingers and trolls. Who say don't Renoko Rashidi don't know what he's talking about and those old make heads are not black. But I want to punch them in the nose, man. Intellectually. Notice yes, I said sir. intellectually. Yes, sir. So the next time we do it, let's do the old mech. All yes, right. Yes, sir. You know, I'll be in touch. Brother Joseph, be strong. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Once again, the great Dr. Renoko Rashidi. Man, that was amazing. Like, I, I really feel like. Uh, I just left the family reunion and he just took us on a on a journey. Like Dr. Rashidi, I appreciate you and everything that you do. All of everybody who's tuning in, everybody who's watching this, thank you all. And all of the information and anything that you need to know about Dr. Rashidi, how to contact him, how to learn more about him, it's in the description. It's all in the description. And we're gonna bust more people in the mouth intellectually. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> hey man, until next time, I appreciate y'all. We out of here.